Hello, everyone, and thanks for being here, listening to us online in the OpenAI Plus Data Forum at the Open Source Summit Latin America. Uh, my name is Anime Shing. I'm the CTO and Director for Watson AI and Data Open Technology. And with me, I have my colleague, Tommy. Tommy, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Tommy. Um, I'm a senior software developer at IBM, mostly working on open source technology. And my focus is um, on the AI uh, lifecycle workflow. Thanks. So um, when we look at the topic which we are going to talk about, right, which is the overall level sec ops, right, uh, it can extend into multiple areas. Uh, and it's a very wide field, right? Uh, we'll be going into certain aspects of it, but overall for us, you know, it falls under the larger umbrella of trusted and ethical AI. And I think one of the quotes from uh, Thomas uh, Junior Watson Senior, I really like, uh, former CEO of IBM, that says, you know, the toughest thing about the power of trust is very difficult to build and very very easy to destroy. And that is one of the tenets uh, we follow while we build uh, ethical and trusted AI within IBM. Now, I think we are all aware by this point that you know AI is powering all the critical workflows right across different domains: healthcare, customer management, employment, credit, right, and we want to make sure. And I think in general, the industry wants to make sure that, you know, um, trust and ethics are built into these workflows, which are now being driven uh, by AI. Now, what do we mean by trusted AI, right? What do you, what does it take to actually trust a decision uh, which is made by a machine? Uh, from our perspective, you know, the characteristics are, is it fair? Can anybody tamper with it? Is it easy to understand? Does it handle privacy? Is it transparent? All these different pillars that I form, and there are many more, right? I mean, if you look into the industry definition, uh, trusted and ethical AI can have different offshoots. Uh, to handle that, uh, coming from the pillars of, uh, you know, the trusted AI, we essentially not only, you know, are focusing on what it means, but also, you know, how do you implement it? And to enable uh, uh, the community at large in terms of how to implement it, we actually, uh, developed a lot of projects in IBM research, and then we moved it out in open source. So we have a project like, uh, you know, if you ask the question, can anybody tamper with it? We have a project called Adversary Robustness 360, and I will be diving into it later. Is it fair? On similar lines, this project is called AI Fairness 360, and that's also, you know, out in the open source. Explainability, I think that's the very fundamental and very basic characteristic of uh, the AI lifecycle, and when your models are making those critical decisions for you. You want them to explain the predictions and AI Explainability 360 is essentially an open source project in that area. And last but not the least, a lineage, right? You want to be able to trace back um, and audit if a model is making these life-changing decisions for you. What was the data set which was used to train the model? What were the hyperparameters used? What are the characteristics of the model parameters? Is the data set uh, diverse enough you can you know trace back using lineage and we have a project called ai fact 360 which essentially the spec is in open source and it's uh, interestingly also being part of the linux foundation s bomb project where you know the software bill of materials will start including uh, ai fact sheets as part of it uh so the three key projects as i was talking about uh AI yeah, Explainability 360, AI yeah, Fairness 360, Adversarial Robustness 360. And if you're wondering uh, uh, the, the relevance of 360, hopefully, you know, these diagrams explain what do we mean. Uh, so when we are looking at, for example, let's say in this case, uh, fairness, we are not only looking at from the perspective of a model, right? The toolkit actually addresses across the whole life cycle, right? Is your data set fair, right? So what we call pre-processing, right? Are the classifiers which are being produced, they are fair. So while you are going through the machine learning development process for that model, right, you can use techniques and algorithms. And then, you know, definitely post-processing, once the models are deployed, can we detect those predictions and, and classify is this fair or not fair? So that's the theme, and that's where the focus at a 360 degree level comes up. Similarly, when you look at AI explainability 360, uh, you know, can we explain the data set features, the data set distribution, can we explain the models both at an individual prediction level for a particular transaction and also at a global level where you know the transactions are happening over a period of time and can we go and explain how the model is performing over a range of uh, predictions.
And I think open source uh, with a single vendor is not a true open source. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, we move these projects in an open governance model where a neutral entity is holding them and there are no licensing concerns and governance concerns. So as part of that, we moved all these projects to Linux Foundation AI and data. In fact, we have been instrumental and, and working together with Linux Foundation in terms of, you know, shaping the Linux Foundation AI and data landscape. And as part of that uh, formation of LFAI and data, we also launched a committee called uh, Trusted AI Committee, right, which has been centered around two working groups, uh, the principles working group, which defines what does it mean when we call something trusted and ethical AI, and then a technical working group, which has been implementing the codes and the techniques and the algorithms responsible for uh, providing these. And we are not doing it alone. Uh, the Trusted AI Committee has grown pretty big and pretty huge. We have participation from Microsoft, DARPA, Troji, General Motors, Tencent, a lot of these different institutes which are uh, contributing uh, to this uh, particular work stream. And if you would like to join, we definitely invite, uh, uh, you know, please reach out to uh, one of us or, you know, hit that wiki link which is pasted here. Now, as part of the principles working group, uh, the principles working group uh, came up with eight principles for trusted AI, what they call uh, repeats or repeats. And uh, if you look at it, you know, that expands the initial pillars, which I was talking about, what does it mean for trusted AI? And, and the terms they're using, reproducibility, robustness, equitability, privacy, explainability, accountability, transparency, and security, right? These are the eight principles from which the LFAI trusted AI committee is looking at the overall trusted AI landscape. And if you want to join the meetings, as well as, you know, uh, look at the webpage, which is hosting these projects, please click the link. The meeting link here has all the information you need to be able to join these by uh, the monthly sync ups, which we are running on this. Okay, so these are the eight principles as I talked about, which the trusted AI committee members cross organization, cross geography went together and, and came back with what it means, you know, work across multiple organizations for AI to be called trusted and ethical, right? Now, uh, one thing to highlight is, you know, no principle is of higher priority than any other. And, and uh, you know, they're all of equal importance and value, right? And they're all related to each other. You will see overlaps between different principles. For example, you know, uh, between transparency and accountability and explainability, you will see things, right, which can fit into either of the criteria. Uh, but in this context, right, we essentially wanted to focus on the three principles, which are around security, robustness, and privacy, which is where, you know, the overall field of MLSEC ops lies. And you may uh, want to ask at this particular point, uh, what does MLSEC ops mean, right? I mean, the way we are looking at it currently, and this is a slide I borrowed from, uh, uh, you know, one of the committee members, Alejandro, uh, he leads and he's actually forming an MLSecOps committee under the Trusted AI Committee, a group which will be focused essentially around this work, right? And, and the way to look at it is it's the intersection of uh, MLOps, SecOps, and DevOps. I think most of us are familiar with DevOps practices and principles. Uh, MLOps uh, is not so recent anymore. Like it is something which has become very, very prominent in the last, uh, I would say, two to three years where you know, how to bring uh, machine learning engineers, data scientists, and demo folks together so as to be working on a platform and looking at the whole machine learning life cycle uh, from the same prism and lens. And SecOps is, is, you know, essentially in the security domain, right? How do you apply security principles working jointly with your operations team and automate all that. The intersection of all these three things essentially forms the ML SecOps. Now, the MLSecOps as such can have very, very divergent and various dimensions, right? And we would, won't be able to go into this talk, right? We, uh, into all those different uh, dimensions of, uh, you know, uh, but the crux of it here will be more focused on, you know, AI security. And the reason uh, in that particular uh, specific domain, right? Uh, if you look at the latest Gartner research, uh, one of the things which they presented was that, you know, uh, around 600 plus executives when they did that survey, that machine learning is actually presenting a new attack surface and increases a lot of the security risk, right? And, and the outcome coming is like, you know, the, that awareness of that risk is low. There is a low understanding of AI security. What does it mean? And as a result of it, the security posture is close to zero, right? Why is it uh, so important? I, I think we all understand the, the relevance, but also when you look at it now from a legal perspective, right? Yes, uh, 
uh, GDPR, as we all know, right, this came in and, and this made mandatory that whenever we are using and storing and processing user data, there are a set of guidelines which we need to follow. And even though it originated in Europe, this is a practice which has been widely adopted across the globe, right? And one thing which is becoming very clear is that many of the provisions in GDPR are very, very relevant to AI as well. Right. In fact, as, as a result of, you know, some of this research, which is being done, right? Some of the AI models can be classified as personal data. So essentially the rules, which we need to follow for GDPR, they need to be applied here as well. And not only that, like, obviously there is a quite a bit of work, you know, uh, being done in terms of crafting rules and regulations. Uh, the European Commission, etc. They are putting up already some regulations, etc., which will come out. Now, but this paper essentially called out that you know can be you can actually run membership inference attacks, model inversion attacks, and get access to some of the private and sensitive data which was used to train the model. In that context, you know essential and extra security steps need to be taken. Okay, uh, so coming to, to the very end of the spectrum, right? Like what does adversarial, uh, adversarial machine learning mean, right? Now, this is a very simple example, hopefully very easy and straightforward to understand. Uh, all of us, you know, are, have been uh, depositing checks, right, uh, to our banks and off late, a lot of us are doing using mobile phones, right? Now, by generating adversarial images, it's, it's, uh, it has been found right, right, based on different uh, research that it's easy to fool these machine learning models by adversarially modifying these images, which are hard to, uh, you know, uh, detect or get prominence from the perspective of a human brain. But then, you know, a model might interpret it as separately different thing. Like in this case, I'm depositing a check of $153, right? And with some minor adversarial examples and noise inserted into this, uh, we can get a 753 uh, credit from the bank right because this uh, check image was adversarially modified now this is uh, a, a more uh, i would say you know the, the more severe impact of what adversarial modification can do in this case what you're seeing is like if for example you know the stop signs on the roads are either uh, adversarially modified knowingly or because of the wear and tear over a period of time you know <clears throat> they they uh, have been, you know, uh, contaminated, it's very easy for self-driving cars to get fooled and not stop at a stop sign, right? Now, the, you're then looking at a very, very severe consequence in these kind of cases, right? So I think it's very, very clear that having adversarial protection and adversarial checks in your models is, is necessary. Otherwise, we can have severe contra. And these are not things only happening in theory, right? It is actually happening in practice, right? So if you look at, you know, all these headlines which have been appearing, uh, for example, you know, uh, evasion of classification in antivirus products, or, you know, the example which I was just showing you, uh, right, which was coming from a research paper, but then, you know, uh, there were real world adversarial patches, right, which were, uh, used on, on cars and then, you know, which ended up in uh, the car actually losing control and leading to damages and in injury, right? Uh, again, uh, if you, for example, you can stage evasion attacks against email protection system, which then, you know, bypasses the email security system and increases your chance of phishing attacks. So a lot of these attacks are actually happening in real world and they are prevalent all over the place currently. Now, when you look at, you know, the adversarial machine learning and adversarial threats against machine learning models and applications, uh, you can uh, look at it from various perspectives, right? For example, there is an evasion attack, which is, you know, you can modify the input to influence the behavior of a model, right? So the prediction input, which is coming in, uh, that can be intercepted and modified. Poisoning attack, which is essentially, you know, you can add uh, noise, uh, you can contaminate the training data if you have access to it, and then use that as a backdoor later on, right? Uh, you can launch extraction of uh, uh, attacks, which can then, you know, steal a proprietary model uh, if you are having models which are very, very specific to your domain and carry a lot of, uh, you know, domain-specific information. You don't want that to happen, right? And inference attack, which is, you know, uh, 
you can you can use these attacks to infer uh, the data and the privacy and the security bits and the data as well, right, which are getting exposed. So to handle all this, uh, as I mentioned very briefly early on, right, we, we have a tool in open source, which IBM launched. It's called Adversarial Robustness Toolbox. It's essentially a Python library for machine learning security. And that, you know, it provides tools for developers and uh, researchers for all kinds of tasks, whether classification, object detection, uh, certification, et cetera, and works across frameworks, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet, and with all kinds of data, text, image, tables, video, et cetera. Now, obviously, there are red team tools, right? So, for example, when attackers are coming, they are doing poisoning evaluation, inference evaluation, extraction evaluation. But then, you know, beyond just giving you tools to simulate these attacks, we also give you blue team tools, right? Which is essentially ways to defend against those attacks, right? So you can do poison detection, you can run adversarial training, evasion detection, etc. As part of this particular project. Uh, the project has become very popular, more than 3,000 GitHub stars currently, 150,000 plus downloads, uh, more than 8,000 commits, and being used by many companies, including Microsoft, Troj AI, Intel, uh, General Motors, etc. And then, as you can see, they have also launched their own toolkits on top of our adversarial business toolbox. And as part of uh, the, the progress of the pro project, like in May of 2022 this year, uh, we essentially, you know, graduated the project. This is the highest level in uh, Linux Foundation AI and data. And as you can see from the quotes from different uh, companies, like they're all using it, they're highly impressed by it, and they're leveraging it to enhance adversarial security in their models. Okay. And very quickly, how does it work? Like if uh, in this case, like this is a very simpler way of showing, right? In this case, you can simulate an attack. For example, this is a Siamese cat. And a model is 92% confident that this is a Siamese cat, right? But if we introduce an attack like, let's say, CNW attack, and we increase the strength to medium, the model has lost its confidence, and it's like thinking this is an ambulance, and it is 90% confidence this is an ambulance. Now, so the tool only doesn't give you ways to simulate these attacks. You can actually defend. Right, so in this context, we can use something like spatial smoothing, right, which essentially reduces the pixel area of on an image, so the attack surface reduces a lot. And if we implement that particular defense mechanism, then the model is back to 94% confidence in this case that this is a cat. Right, so that in essence is the nutshell of the tool. And with that, I will pass on to Tommy to talk a bit about how does this tool fit into the larger ML ops lifecycle. Remember, we are talking about you know the ML SecOps, so. You know, this is this is the core ML uh, security you can introduce in your models uh, so as to be able to defend against different kinds of attacks. But then, you know, how do you integrate into the larger ML ops and, and DevOps uh, lifecycle? That's where, you know, Tommy is going to focus next. So, Tommy, please. Yeah. Thanks, Amish. So, uh, let, let me uh, share my screen. So uh, as Adam have mentioned about the importance of like AI security, now how we I, I able to like enable this AI security on top of let's say platform like Qflow or Kserve. Um, so to begin with, we want to introduce a little bit background on what is um, Qflow. So uh, Qflow is a very popular you know uh, platform that runs you know AI lifecycle on top of Kubernetes. And within Qflow, the, one of the very you know, popular project is the Qflow project. It actually helps you know users to orchestrate all their you know workflows on top of Kubernetes. And the beauty of Qflow pipeline is that you're able to like containerize all your like, ML tasks inside a container, so you could actually put any kind of code, any kind of language, any kind of frameworks inside a container, and then run that on top of Qflow pipelines. And with the flexibility of able to containerize your workflow, Qflow pipeline also produces a way for you to connect all those workflows using a simple Python DSL and able to help you like use that DSL to configure any of your input parameters and output parameters easily using like Pythons right, on top of it. And once you build up these pipelines, right, this pipeline could also share within, you know, other users within the same organization, and you could also schedule them to run them like periodically or also by on demand to, you know, help you automate your um, ML workflows. And with the, um, uh, use, uh, with the tool 
such as Gift for Pipeline, we could able to integrate, you know, trusted AI to help us, you know, find the AI vulnerabilities or uh, doing our developments and doing production stage once we the AI has been deployed on the cloud as well. Um, one of the you know, way you could use it during development is that when you develop a model, right? Let's say you train the models um, using Kubo Pipeline. Like once the training step is done, you could actually just embed a just the AI component to help you check whether or not um, this AI is um, robust enough to you know serve in production. And if not, you could just you know pull it back to um, do further development. Or if it's like, ready to production, you could you know immediately like serve it online and let other users start using your new models. And this is just an extra check uh, during your development stage. Just make sure that your, a your model is like, um, not vulnerable to any external attacks. Um, and here we're going to introduce one of the, you know, uh, our components we have developed right, for Kubo Pipeline. Um, in this, you know, components is mainly focused on the white box attack. So we're basing, basically using like a gradient based attack. Uh, in this case, uh, once your model is being trained, you could pass down like your, uh, you know, model information such as loss function optimizer and specify the type of attack. Uh, and in this case, I think um, this component takes in a, a fast gradient um, sign method attacks as the base, and then um, train a adversary robust uh, models and use that to attack against our uh, developed models. And at the bottom, you can see. Um, just with a vanilla, you know, base MS model, MS model that's, you know, trained on um, classifying uh, handwritten digits. Um, regularly, you, like a basic model could have, let's say, 87% accuracy, but with just a very simple attack, right, uh, based on the gradients, um, the, uh, put, uh, the adversarial model could be able to, like, modify the image and make the uh, accuracy of, like, the same data sets down to, like, 13% uh, accuracy. Um, as you can see, that's like a very um, bad um, um, security uh, vulnerability or on top of your developed models. Uh, and you can also see like on average, the competency of your, uh, of the same models um, accuracy is also down by 24%. So with this kind of like uh, extra metric, uh, we could able to like, you know, tell whether or not, you know, um, the model is ready for production or is it we need to continue to develop and make it more robust before we actually put it out to the public for user to use. And uh, once, you know, like once you actually do pass the development stage or um, once you have done, you know, everything to make sure your model is being ready to deploy. Now, um, we want to find like a good, you know, framework able to like deploy, it, not just only deploy those models, but also able to monitor them and give us feedback on how these models do in terms of security and performance, um, et cetera, right, over time, right? Because a model could behave differently be depending on different data. And, you know, data could, you know, change on a daily basis and you might not be aware of, like, um, like new data coming in um, compared to the, the data you use during the development stage. So to serve, you know, like uh, model in production on top of Kubernetes, well, the very popular, uh, you know, um, project is called KSERF. KSERF used to be part of the Q4 pipelines, and I think um, this year has been graduated to LFAI, um, which um, is an open foundation um, organization. And uh, KSERF, the goal of KSERF is actually to help, you know, users to able to serve their models on top of Kubernetes uh, within the serverless platform, and also provide extra tools like canary rollouts, uh, model explanation, and able to do extra pre-processing and pro-processing as part of their predictions. Um, and as, as over here, like we also integrate the same, you know, trusted AI tool with KSERF. So you could also use like, uh, all the trusted AI, um, tools to verify your production models as they, you know, are running in production. And, um, the integration we have done on top of, uh, KSERF is actually at two ways. One is what we call like online explanation evaluation, which we actually takes like a active explainer server and all the user when they actually like do a transaction to that server, we will take that transaction and do a real time explanation. So we could use tools such as the explainer 360 tools or the adversary robustness tool to give us a real time explanation on that particular transactions. And that will give you like how, you know, like what are the, you know, uh, vulnerability or weight is being um, value on that particular transactions. You could, so you could actually see how that uh, position is being evaluated. 
uh, of course, like just evaluating on one particular transaction might not give you the whole picture. So we also have like an offline evaluation of what we call also called detection. Um, this is more on an event time based and run asynchronously, where user could just regularly just predict any prediction on the model server and get feedback without any delays. And in the back end, we have a logger, uh, which we log the payload into uh, a data store that users or uh, our deployer have de been defined. And behind the scenes, uh, we still have our explainer server that actually monitoring the data store. And once we reach a certain uh, threshold or a certain period of time, we will evaluate all those historical uh, logging data and detect any prediction that has you know, vulnerabilities. And we will notify back to the user and back to like, our admins to know, oh, this model is being you know, vulnerable for, uh, let's say, 5% like of the time during you know, the last two hour period. Um, and you know, this kind of like offline evaluation is very useful to evaluate, let's say, the fairness of the model where you need a collection of predictions to make sure like, um, the, the output of the prediction is not skewed to a certain um, schema. And also we still could do the robustness you know, detection using the like offline evaluations where we want to see uh, how many, you know, um, kind of picture is actually being alternated right, within the past period of um, like two, two hour predictions. And uh, with this, let me just introduce a little bit background on how, you know, the online and offline prediction is being done on KSERF. So on KSERF, when a user try to you know, either predict or explain um, a prediction of the models, it usually goes to like a endpoint. It could be default canary endpoints, and that usually just get forward to a transport where they pre-process and pro-process their request. And if a user wants real-time, you know, um, evaluations, right, uh, for the models, they could just go to the explain endpoints. Or if they just want to, like, you know, uh, do offline or, or they don't care about the real-time explanation, they could just straightly go to the predict endpoint and get the result. And um, our admin, our case of platform, could still evaluate those. Uh, predictions by right, using the offline evaluation in the backend by logging, you know, our user prediction data. Um, so let's, you know, go over some of the, you know, basic examples on how a online and offline evaluation looks like uh, using the average robustness toolbox. So let's begin with a online evaluation. So when we're going to do a online evaluation uh, in case of, we are going to actually call the um, explainer server directly um, and give us back the result uh, at the same time. So when we actually go prediction, let's say we send a picture of an original um, image, let's say one, um, the explainer will actually just uh, use that and you know um, and run a adversarial uh, training to create adversarial models. And that model basically just generate noise and add on top of that image. And with the result of that you know, noise image, it will actually able to determine whether or not this image is able to pass the robustness check or not. Um, and usually like what we have um, integrated like, uh, ways to, you know, um, add this noise is based on, you know, the model name, like what kind of models is being um, targeted for this attack and what kind of, you know, type of attack, like every serial model we want to train based on this um, image uh, and models. And we also like able to uh, allow users to configure like how long they want and how robust they want this every server attack to be, um, and uh, what kind of you know like positive or negative class um, this result has. So we can actually like um, alter you know the class when we actually uh, add noises to that original pictures. Um, and to do that on top of case of it's very simple. We just add you know all those parameters we have previously defined on top of our deployment YAMLs. So you could see, you could simply add an explainer server by configuring what type of attack you want to use and how many class is in your model. So we could alter um, your result into a different class, right? Um, and this explainer basically acts as an online uh, explanation server because you could actually get real time uh, feedback um, using this new explainer definition. Um, and of course, like uh, behind the scenes, what it's going to do is just basically um, have you see you have seen before we uh, the client is actually calling the explainer server directly. Um, and of course, behind the scenes, the explainer server might need to do some extra predictions back to the predictor to just get some results on how to alternate that image, right? What kind of noise it has to be added to alternate that image? And once you know collect all the feedback, it will just return back you know the explanation metrics. As long as, um, as as well as the uh, prediction 
match uh, back to the user, so the user could have a overall idea how their image is being predicted and how their image is being alternated. Um, so I think with this, I'll just go over a very simple demos. Um, so right now we have our you know our prediction server like kind of deployed on KSERF, and any user could just simply you know do like um, you know a simple curl request right that targeting at the explainer endpoint and gives like a um, a server host name where the model is being deployed. And once we you know, run this simple little you know, prediction, um, I basically uh, just kind of like wrap those um, prediction result in a Python script so we can also visualize what kind of um, explanation we actually get from the explainer server. Um, and so as we can see, once you know, the explainer server came back with you know two um, different um, Outputs. One is the original picture. You can see the original picture you have sent out. We also predict them. That is the original three. That is correct. However, we also get like an evaluation on what kind of metrics we could like, what kind of noise we could add into this picture to alternate the class right um, into like a prediction uh, to a class nine. Um, so you can see like we, um, the the model basically just like train for like 20, 30 seconds and able to add, like, figure out what kind of noise is necessary to add. On top of this picture to alternate this class without even need to access the you know the model code or the model gradients. So we could see how powerful we could actually use the adversary robustness toolbox to help us identify vulnerability and able to uh, um, help us know like how we want to like defend this you know uh, kind of attack as well. So um, so we now we kind of see how you know like um, AI security could be done in a real time manner, um, but more importantly because we not everyone you know care about just um, getting real time uh, feedbacks because uh, it might you know take time to compute right for each each transaction. So a more common way to actually do this um, in a batch or do it more efficient in in the um, organization is to actually do it offline, and with offline we could actually compute like more robust information on the robustness and also on the fairness side as well. So um, one of the uh, integration we, um, we're going to show right now is how you how you actually use, could use offline evaluation to let's say calculate the fairness, right? Um, of these particular models, right? Uh, using a fairness detection inside KSERF. So um, usually when, you know, uh, a user kind of like uh, predict their results, um, they might just create like, one transaction. And once we collect, let's say, a collection of four, like, in this case, it's four different transactions, we'll be able to use a tool called AF360 to help us calculate uh, what kind of metrics um, we, we could look at, right? We could kind of look at the base rate, like the the ratio between the um, uh, the uh, the true positive and true negatives to make sure like uh, they are more consistent. Um, and also, we could just uh, evaluate like um, the display impact. So we want to make sure like um, the ratio between um, uh, um, like to a particular class is not like um, too much over the other class, right? Um, and and this is just like one you know single evaluation on one collection of um, uh, data. But um, if we want to do it do it, do it continuously, we have to have like continuous way to you know log the data as well and store in database and do it from a period and period and on demand basis as well. And with this, um, you know, case of actually introduce a way to do you know payload logging, to enable like all these features right on top of trusted AI. And basically in the back end, um case will just you know uh, have a logger that you know, collect you know user prediction and store them into a what we call a cloud event protocols. And then you know, um, our admin and uh, our deployer could just use to just could just collect all those cloud events and you know apply and, and you know like kind of process them and make format them in a good way. So our trust AI tool could actually analyze and produce useful metrics, right? Um, using this class event. And because the you know, cloud event is not just any kind of um, it's not like format in a JSON or um, it just kind of format in a event you know uh, payload we need some you know ingestion um, doing our um, uh, log collection to able to make them useful and accessible for from our uh, trusted AI tools so one of the things we have kind of integrated is using you know Kafka um, 
and build on top of um, Knative eventing. So what we have to done is like uh, when a case of logger sends event um, to let's say we ha we have this uh, Knative eventing to collect all those car events, we kind of like push them to the Kafka cluster right um, using like a topic channel to publish all those topics. And then we also have an ingester. Uh, in this case, we're using like a Kafka Connect uh, uh, component to actually just um, a, a, a use it as our consumer to consume all, all those events and ingest those events into JSON. So once the payload is ingested into JSON, we, then we could push those formatted JSON um, objects, right, to a, let's say, a persistent DB. In this case, we just use like a MySQL DB. Um, so our server, in this case, uh, Air F360, could just easily to, to pull from a database, you know, also filter them based on user time, uh, certain attribute, you could all filter them and then just, you know, evaluate uh, what kind of data you want to collect, what kind of data you want to evaluate on, and you know, have a very uh, useful metrics. Just doing a time check, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, you may want to ramp up. Right. Um, so now uh, let, let's close up with a, a last video demo because this kind of um, process kind of takes a lot of um, you know setup. So we just have a very simple, uh, fast demo. So in this case, we're gonna like demonstrate how we have deployed you know KFD eventing with uh, all the Kafka brokers to collect all the events and have also have the uh, Kafka connector to consume the events right and ingest them into a database. So once we have that setup, uh, as you can see, we have deployed a um, case of models, and this is based on a German credit um, models, which it just calculate the um, uh, user risk um, when they let's say apply for a loan or apply for any kind of uh, information. Um, so once we you know like just do a simple prediction, let's say we we predict um, like a list of user, and and based on this user we calculate with it. Or not they have a credit risk where for applying a loan. We could see like um nine out of ten users is um doesn't have any risk and only one user have risk that's the 2.0 and those events will get you know passed into a Kafka um you know channel so I, um that you know basically collects you know all, all those information and we could you know in this case we want to just demonstrate you could actually see those events get passed in, in real time so when we you know create this prediction right on the case of model. It actually ingested uh, or passed the event in real time. And our Kafka connector can able to ingest those events in real time. As you can see, like in this case, the database only have like 76, or well, now, now it has been increased to 86 uh, row. As we, you know, kind of like doing more prediction, it could ingest more row um, to the database. So um, our AF360 server could actually get those those um, new data and you know calculate a new set of metrics based on those data. And of course, last and not least, with all these metrics, we could also put them into a monitoring service, right, at the very end. Um, so once you have um, you know collect all those metrics, you could also push them into like Prometheus, and with Prometheus, that's the time series database. You could actually like. Um, also visualize them using like Grafana dashboard use, uh, when, when, when we push those metrics like, to Prometheus. And with uh, Grafana, you could, uh, sorry, with, um, um, yes, uh, yeah, with Grafana, you could visualize the Prometheus metrics. Uh, as you can see over time, as we're doing the same prediction more and more, because that prediction have a lot of um, results that, that kind of classified user have um, lower risk. So you can see like the base rate, right? Um, the base rate we kind of calculate there is actually going down uh, over time because we have like more skilled results, right? Over one category. Um, and this is kind of information you could collect in real time and able to monitor to just make sure your model is not, you know, too skilled in a certain way. And with this, uh, we kind of like summarize like how this, um, you know, offline and online evaluation could be done using all these trusted AI tool. Um, and you want to you know, reach out to our um, um, GitHubs, feel free to go to the uh, Trusted AI um, organization. We have all these Trusted AI um, tools, like Adversary Versions Toolbox, AF360, and AX Explanation 360, along with the Slack channel in this size. Um, with this, thank you very much. And feel free to hop up into our Monday call to know more about Trusted AI and how they could be used in terms of the uh, MLSEC hubs. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching.